Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Equipping Hour. Thank you for being here. All right, I'm going to just open our time uh, with a word of prayer, and then we'll, uh, we'll jump into the lesson for today. God, thank you so much for your word. Uh, as we focus over the next few weeks on the clarity of your word, it is uh, wonderful to be reminded of the gift that we have in your clear speech. Uh, your word is sufficient and powerful and endures forever. And we have everything that we need in what you've spoken to us to walk wisely, to know how to live in this world, to even see what may not be obvious to some with incredible clarity that we might know you, that we would discern between what is uh, true and what is false, what is right, what is error. God, I pray that you would establish Grace Bible Church, that you would use this next hour as well as the subsequent weeks to further establish us in the a perspicuity of your word, that it would make us unflinching and steadfast in the face of persecution, and that you would use even those trials, uh, should they come, to glorify your own name, to build your church, uh, to make much of your gospel. And we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. So over the uh, last week and over the next few weeks, we're going to be continuing in our series that I've titled Blood for Clarity, Blood for Clarity. And in this series, we are highlighting one particular characteristic of God's Word, which is the perspicuity of Scripture, which is just a big word that means clarity. So the clarity of Scripture, and alongside the perspicuity of Scripture, we will highlight the persecution of God's people and why those things must go together for Christians who suffer. Turn back to 1 Kings chapter 22. This is where we were last week. looking at a prophet named Micaiah who died because he had received a clear word from God. In 1 Kings 22, just jump down. We'll, we won't reread the whole thing, but look at verse 26, and we'll see Micaiah's sentence. The king of Israel, that's Ahab, said, Take Micaiah and return him to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son. And say, Thus says the king, Put this man in prison and feed him sparingly with bread and water until I return. Micaiah said, If you indeed return safely, Yahweh has not spoken by me. And he said, listen, all you people. Micaiah, the prophet who had received this clear word from God regarding Ahab's destruction, that God intended to ruin, uh, bring destruction on Ahab, that he would die in battle. Micaiah articulates this clear word from God to the king, and the penalty for this word of destruction, this bad prophecy, this unfavorable word from God for Ahab, you see in verse 27, is to put him in prison and feed him 
sparingly with bread and water, or literally with the bread of affliction and the waters of affliction. He would, Micaiah would be in prison, fed just enough to keep him alive long enough until the king could return from this about 43-mile journey uh, from Ramoth Gilead back to the city where Micaiah is put in prison would have been about uh, a 43 to 50-mile journey. And if you factor in the time that it would have taken for the battle to conclude, Micaiah is uh, going to be in, in prison for quite some time, but just fed long enough for the king to come back safely. And clearly from Micaiah's prophecy, he has already told the king, you're not coming back from the battle. You're not coming back safely. And he repeats himself in verse 28, if you indeed return safely, Yahweh has not spoken by me. And then invites, admonishes, and commands all the people to hear what he's, what he's actually said. God has spoken clearly. And so by implication, you read the rest of the story and you see that Ahab is shot with an arrow aimed at no one in particular, but guided by the providence of God to hit Ahab while he's in disguise, and he bleeds out, essentially, in his chariot, which fulfills previous prophecies and what happens after that. So Micaiah would have eventually starved in prison, being fed not enough to sustain him permanently, or day by day, but just enough to sustain him until the king came back many days later. And so Micaiah gave his blood because of, for God's clarity. It's important even to, as we kind of transition out of this story into some other passages, to just consider for a moment that Micaiah did not choose the issue for which he died. Just think about that. The, you know, Micaiah, of all the things that he could have died for this day, right? The, the coming of the Messiah, uh, the, the truthful words of, of the law and what was spoken previously, um, things that we would like to, to die for, perhaps, if you've ever imagined martyrdom, you've probably pictured yourself going out in a blaze of glory justification by faith, faith alone, or, or the gospel, penal substitutionary atonement, right? And they light the flames under you, and you say something great to be remembered for generations later. This is not what is happening in this story. This prophet simply tells the king, you're not going to survive this battle and he dies because of it. It's a good reminder for us that we don't choose which hills we want to die on. We do not choose, as Christians, which hills we get to die on. If I'm going to be martyred, it's going to be for this issue or this issue. And it's popular in our day to talk about the hills that we should die on, right? Um, being in a comfortable culture where we're not experiencing heavy persecution like Christians for many ages have been, we have the luxury of sitting back in our comfortable pews, chairs, and talking about the hills that we should die on as Christians. Don't pick a fight over that battle. Don't die on that hill. Die on these hills. These are first order doctrines. These are second order doctrines, and these are tertiary or further down the line, and we shouldn't divide over those things. Well, the Christian doesn't actually have that freedom to decide what hills we die on. Who decides that? Persecutors decide that. The person who decides that they're going to kill a Christian over whatever issue they find worthy of death 
they have decided what the Christian is going to die for. And Micaiah is in that very same situation. Uh, Our job as Christians is just to stand where God stands. If the culture tells us today the issue for which Christians are going to die is homosexuality, and in order to survive, you have to say that two men or two women can be legitimately married at the cost of your life, then that's the issue for which we'll die. If, the Christ, if persecutors say that creation is the issue over which we have to die, and we, and we have to deny that God created in six literal days, then guess what? That's the issue over which the Christian must die. Not because we've deemed it worthy of death and that we have that authority, but simply because God has spoken clearly, and so we must stand where he stands. If the Christian is going to confidently, boldly, humbly endure whatever persecution God has for us in the future that we don't know about today, we have to be fortified by, an, by our understanding of the perspicuity of Scripture. The better you know, the clearer that you know that God's word is clear, the better you will be equipped to stand in the face of persecution. And so this week and next week, we're going to answer the question, how clear is God's word really? How clear is God's word really? How clear is it actually? We're going to answer that question several different ways. The first answer I have for you to, to the question, how clear is God's word really? God's word is as clear as God's own mind. God's word is as clear as God's own mind. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. This might be one of the best places to see the clarity that exists inside God's own thought life. God possesses a clarity in his own mind, and God communicates the clarity of his own mind. That's what communication is. Whenever you communicate, whether in verbal or written form, you are communicating to the best of your ability what before you communicated no one else sees. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 2. Who knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit that's in him? So we see the clarity, both of these things in Genesis, that God possesses a clarity in his own mind and communicates the clarity of his own mind in creation. Just think about this. Before any person outside of God, outside of the Trinity... You have Father, Son, and Spirit, those three persons in one divine being. Before anything else existed to interpret his speech or to comprehend his clarity, we get a picture into how crystal clear God's thoughts and communication were on the first day of creation. Genesis chapter 1, verse 3 says, Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. That may not seem at first glance profound. You may not marvel initially at the statement that you've heard probably dozens of times. God said, let there be light and there was light. You ever wondered why the following statement after God said, let there be light, it doesn't say, and there was a tree. How come a turtle didn't pop into existence when God said, let there be light? It's because God was clear. Whatever light is, whether it's made up of particles or waves or whatever, all that light is came into existence the moment that God commanded that it exist. 
just an expression of his will. For, uh, for you Hebrew students, the, the, the verb there, let there be, cal imperfect 3ms jessive. Uh, in the Hebrew, the jussive sense is just an expression of the will. And here, God, by mere, merely communicating his will to the heavens and earth that then exist, <laughs> just by communicating his will, expressing his will in words, things begin to exist. And the things that begin to exist are exactly what existed in God's mind. This thing called light. God called it light before it existed, and the very thing that he called it began to exist. That is impeccable clarity. God's word is perspicuous. It's clear. It was clear on creation And it was clear before there was anyone else to tell him or have an opinion about whether it was clear. It was clear. The same thing is true on the second day of creation. Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. Verses 7 and 8 document that it happens. Verse 9, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear And then Moses simply writes, and it was so. Because God desired it, it was so. It was clear. And then on and on and on throughout chapter 1. We're, We're honing in on the clarity of God's word, and you see that when God speaks. It's clear because what he has in mind, what he says, actually happens in the very same way he says it. Prophecy functions like that. When he says something is going to happen, when he wills something to happen, it happens. Even uh, providence functions very much the same way. Lamentations chapter 3 says that this is the case. The things that we don't know about that God has actually decreed will take place, will take place. Lamentations 3 verse 37 says, Who is there who speaks and it comes to pass unless the Lord has commanded it? When you say, I'm going to do something, the only reason you ultimately do that thing is because God has first declared that you will. If you say, I'm going to the store, I'll be right back, if you in fact do go to the store and you be right back, it's because God has said you would go to the store and be right back. Verse 38, is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both good and ill go forth? Everything that happens to us in life, whether it be good or be evil, and everything in between, happens actually by the decree of God. It is from, according to verse 38, the mouth of the Most High. And verse 37, what the Lord has commanded. Both providence and prophecy function that way. The things unrevealed that happen, happen by God's will, happen by his divine decree. The things that he reveals that will happen, happen in time, by the same will. That highlights the clarity of God's word. But every attribute of God, including his clarity, that is expressed when he speaks, the scriptures bear those same attributes. Say that again. Whatever attributes are expressed by God when he speaks are also possessed by the scriptures. Let me show you this in in Psalm 19. Psalm 19, starting at verse 7. 
David, of course, now turning his attention from God's general revelation to his specific revelation in his word, which reveals more than just the glory of God, the greatness of God in creation. Verse 7 says, the law of Yahweh, now you get the personal covenant-keeping name of God, so it's more specific in its revelation, the scriptures are, than creation. This law of Yahweh is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of Yahweh is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of Yahweh are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of Yahweh is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of Yahweh is clean, enduring forever. The rules of Yahweh are true and righteous altogether. Even verse 10, more to be desirable than are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Notice the synonyms given for God's word, law, testimony, precepts, commandment, fear, rules. They're even called desirable. Those synonyms capturing uh, are, are all meaning other words for, for God's word, what he has spoken. Is God perfect? So are the scriptures. Is God sure? So are the scriptures. Is there any doubt in God's mind? No. Then neither are, are there in the scriptures. There's nothing doubtful or untrustworthy in them. Is God right? So are the scriptures, according to verse 8. Is God pure? That word meaning clear? <laughs> yes. So are the scriptures. Is God clean? So are the scriptures. Is God true and righteous altogether? Yes, and so are the scriptures. The scriptures are these things because the God who spoke them is these things. Is God all-sufficient and infinitely desirable more than anything under the sun in the created realm? Yes, so are the scriptures. More to be the desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. and on and on. Whatever attributes are possessed by God or expressed, rather, by God when he speaks, the scriptures take on those attributes. The fact that God is clear in his own mind should be um, a reminder for us of why, even though the scriptures are clear, we encounter difficulty, right? The scriptures which are perfectly clear, we don't always see them clearly. Why? Because, again, this is the mind of God. God in the scriptures is giving us a window into his thoughts, into his mind and opinions. And just as God's mind is infinitely clear, God's mind is also infinitely deep. And so when you lack clarity, don't blame God the lack of clarity is not due to anything wrong in God, but simply he is God. Of course you're going to have to work to uncover the meaning. Of course. Why would we expect anything else? When the, the meaning of Scripture comes easy, that is not due to our intellect and our ability but we should credit the kindness of God when the true interpretation of Scripture comes easily to us. When the clarity of God's words leap off the page and make us certain, that is because God is kind and his spirit is at work unveiling the meaning for us. And if you're believing it in, or if you're reading Scripture in a believing way, then all the more all praise be to God. the depth and profundity of the scriptures, even though they are clear, are due to God's infinite mind. And this should give you incredible uh, confidence, and you should be eager, knowing this principle, to read your Bible. In your Bible reading, when you get to uh, passages and parts of scripture, 
that you're tempted to doubt the clarity, to just call to mind, I'm in Numbers or Leviticus or Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel or Revelation or Daniel, it's hard. Remind yourself of the, dif- the difficulty exists not because of a lack of clarity in the scriptures. And all your job is, all you have to do is plead with God and strive alongside your pleadings that God would open up his marvelous clarity for you. And so you should just read, knowing that it's clear, even if you aren't yet clear on what it says. It is clear. How many times have you read a passage and read a passage and read a passage and thought, I'm not sure what that means yet, but I'm going to keep plugging along in my Bible reading? And then the sixth, tenth time you've read that passage, you go, oh, I get it now. Just keep reading. How clear is God's word really? Answer two, as clear as God, God's own glory demands. God's word is as clear as God's glory demands that it be. God's glory, him receiving the glory that he intends, depends on his word being clear. Without clarity, God would not be glorified, and the very end for which God created all things would not be reached. Think about the glory of God as a spirit. God is spirit. He is unlike us in the fact that he does not have members or parts. He does not exist by degrees like we do. We grow, we improve, we age, we decline. God is pure, undefiled spirit alone as he exists in himself. And so we marvel at the fact that God isn't like us. He doesn't, ex- uh, he doesn't have the same weaknesses that we have because we are both body and spirit. He is just spirit. So he's not limited to space and time because he is just spirit. He's not limited and he doesn't incur the weaknesses of having a physical body like we do in and of himself. Jesus, of course, took on flesh, but that's a different issue. But just consider how we should marvel and glorify God as being spirit. If he was not spirit, he could not be clear. Think about the things that impede your own clarity. Fatigue, ignorance, that you you need to grow in your understanding so you can become more articulate and clear. Time, you haven't existed long enough to know better. And so when you speak, many times we speak from ignorance, incomplete knowledge, lack of ability, and growth. God experiences none of those weaknesses because he doesn't have a body and he's not confined to time. All of that in part due to him being spirit. If God was not clear, it would be an indictment on him being pure spirit because he would possess those same limitations as us when we're not clear. Even his glory as creator, we saw this in Genesis 1. If God wasn't clear when he said, let there be light, and he was kind of thinking about something that's kind of like light, but not really, and there was confusion in his own mind, And he said from his confusion, let there be like, you know, light. And something kind of like light came into existence, but not really light. We'd be in a world of trouble. And we wouldn't glorify, we wouldn't look at light, think about the characteristics of light and marvel at the wisdom of God. We wouldn't marvel at God's creative abilities if something kind of like light had come into existence. 
The psalmist in Psalm 139 says, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. My soul knows it very well. That's not a statement about, you know, he's not impressed with himself. (laughs) But he says, he doesn't say, I praise me for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I marvel at myself and exalt me. He says, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God receives glory as creator when we look at his creation because the creation is, is a sight to behold the way that God made it. If God wasn't clear, then he would lose glory as creator. Even think about God's speech, the inseparable connection between God's speech and his glory as savior. God receives glory as savior, and that is dependent on his clarity. Even in being gracious, faithful, and powerful, all of those things demand a clarity from what God has said. For God to be, to receive glory for being gracious, a gracious Savior, for God to receive glory for being a faithful Savior, and for God to receive glory from being a powerful Savior, his word must be clear. Turn to Ephesians 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. All of those blessings that God intends for the Christian, adoption, redemption, glorification, that's to be holy and blameless before him, the love that he set on us, all of that is made known by, through salvation, by saving men, but it's through faith. It is through faith. Verse 13, in him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, have, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Belief has to happen. Can you imagine... If God, in his predestining love and election, delivered an unclear message to be believed, you could not believe an unclear message. If God, even though he was infinitely loving and gracious, elected believers, desiring to save them in time, but he was too inarticulate to deliver a clear message? It doesn't matter how loving he is in predestining. In time, there's confusion and a lack of faith. Faith would be impossible if God wasn't clear. That's Old and New Testament. The gospel's clear in both. And so Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. And the same is true, fast forward to the New Testament, Romans 4. The same thing is true to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is accounted as righteousness. God had to deliver a clear message so that all of that love and grace that he intended and set on us before time would come to fruition. God must be clear if he's going to receive glory as creator. Romans 1.16, you can write down. God has bound his power to a clear message. I am unashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to those who believe. God's power would be weak 
if his word was not clear. If the gospel was not clear, then God's power would not be anything to marvel at. But we can believe the gospel and then glorify God for his powerful message to us. Also, he would, uh, his glory as judge is dependent on his clarity. This is what Paul says in Romans 7. It was the law that highlighted his sin. Even as an unbeliever, the law spoke to Paul and gave him clarity as an unbeliever about the sin he was committing. Look at verse 7. What shall we say then? Romans 7, 7. Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to no sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. How confusing is that? You shall not covet. That's not confusing at all. I was talking to a, a man who was a Jew and insisted that people could be saved by works. And as we had several conversations, it was clear that he started to you know, do what anybody who's going to insist on being saved by works must do and make sin at the desire level, not sin. Right? There's no way that you can say, I'm, I'm saved by my own goodness when you know the thoughts that go through your own head, the desires that you have. And so I eventually pointed him to the, the Ten Commandments, one of them being, thou shalt not covet. That's a desire <laughs> embedded in the law, condemning you for having wayward desires, sinful desires. And then we didn't talk anymore for some reason. <laughs> it's clear God's commands. And so he, we glorify God as the judge in being a just lawgiver. We see the clarity of his commands that even highlight our sin, and we understand God is worthy of glory because he's been so clear. And even in his glory as a judge in being a wrathful executioner, everyone in hell will have the testimony of God's clear revelation to them in his word or even at the, the general revelation level, what God has revealed man must do and be before God is clear to all men. That's Romans 1 and Romans 2. Without his word, we're condemned by what God has revealed. With his word, we're condemned by the clarity of what God has revealed. And so in hell, there's never an excuse and God will be justified in his wrath as the one permanently punishing sinners who refuse to submit to his authority and believe because he had been clear in his revelation. You could add to, to this glory that God receives um, you know, the connection between God's clarity and his glory, depending on that. His glory as father, 1 Thessalonians 2, 10 to 12, Paul says that a father admonishes, urges, rebukes children. That's what fathers do. Uh, if God wasn't clear in his communication, then we wouldn't think well of him, shouldn't think well of him as a father. And also his glory as sanctifier, all that happens through a clear word. John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. You can't be sanctified by unclear truth. You have to know what God requires. How clear is God's word really? Answer three, as clear as scripture synonyms imply. God's word is as clear as scripture synonyms imply. In Scripture, you have the words of God being called by other names. Psalm 119 gives many examples of this. Psalm 
One famous example is verse 105. Here the psalmist writes, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The word here is called a lamp and a light. Those things highlight the clarity of God's word. Is light luminous? Does light illuminate and give clarity? Is a lamp designed to improve vision and clarity of what's already there? Then that makes the point. God's word is clear. Otherwise, it wouldn't be called light. Verse 130 in Psalm 119. The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. God's words are so clear that they merely need to be opened and understood by the one looking into them. And it will grant understanding. It will grant clarity. Words like light, lamp, understanding, insight, knowledge, wisdom, all of those are uh, understanding, insight, knowledge, wisdom are included in Proverbs 2. God's word is called that. From your mouth come knowledge and understanding. It gives clarity, so it must be clear. Even in uh, one book that's often charged with being confusing and obscure, Revelation, it's almost like God wanted us to know he was speaking clearly at the outset of the book because chapter 1, verse 1 of Revelation says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place, and he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant John. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is the disclosing of what would otherwise be hidden and unknown. That implies clarity. If God wanted to leave us in the dark, he would have just not spoken. Revelation, all revelation and the book are intended to be understood. God intends us to understand them. That's why he spoke. How clear is God's word really answer for so clear that it produces clarity. So clear that it produces clarity. We see this and saw this last week in 1 Kings 22 with Micaiah. You see no uncertainty or doubt come from him in his speaking. What right does he have to that kind of certainty? None in and of himself. The only right he has to that kind of certainty is the only right we have to any kind of certainty, and it comes from the certainty and clarity of God's word itself. The only reason you can speak with any authority on what is true is if it comes from the word of God. So scripture is clear enough to produce clarity in the minds of those who look into it. Proverbs 2, we looked at this in the series uh, on racism and social justice and the woke movement. Again, helpful to this conversation. The person who does, verses 1 through 4, engages in a diligent, humble pursuit of God's wisdom in his word, the wisdom that comes from God's mouth, will find verse 9 to be true. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity every good path. 
you can understand, you can have certainty and clarity and true knowledge if you discover God's wisdom, if you understand God's word. Verse 6, he gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. The knowledge and understanding that come from God's mouth that we are looking at in our laps on the page, that understanding can be had by you if you grasp the, the meaning of the scriptures. So it's foolish for anyone to claim that you can't be 100% certain about your interpretation of scripture. Maybe you hold an interpretation of some passage that you shouldn't be 100% certain about, but to say that it's impossible to arrive at the true meaning of a text is absolutely untrue. On Mill Avenue, when we're uh, evangelizing unbelievers, we encounter this charge all the time. Well, that's your interpretation of I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. You have another interpretation? Well, no, not really, but I don't like yours. <laughs> yeah, it's clear. It's so clear that you don't like what it says. And so you would rather blame my, you just rather charge it to being my interpretation, even before you have another one. I just don't want that to be it. God's word is clear. Answer five, how clear is God's word really? It is clear enough to be understood by children. It's even that clear. It's clear enough to be understood by children. Those whom we expect to have the least intellectual abilities, sorry kids, you're, you're early on in life, it's normal. Children have the least ability among us to understand and comprehend. And we understand this, that's normal, that's natural. But God's word is even clear to them, can be made clear to them. Proverbs 1 says that even the Proverbs were written for this purpose, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, don't worry, if you lack Wisdom, you can have it. If you're simple, you can have it. Knowledge and discretion to the youth, to young people. The Proverbs were written for young people. So dive in. Expect to gain clarity. Strive, work to gain clarity. Deuteronomy 6, famous passage about instructing children and God's word having its way in the home life implies this. This is the commandment, chapter 6 of Deuteronomy, verse 1. This is the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments which Yahweh your God has commanded me to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it, so that you and your son and your grandson might Fear Yahweh your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life and that your days may be prolonged. God intends to be feared, not just by older people, not just by adults, but by sons and grandsons. God can be feared. God ought to be feared. He is worthy of the fear, even of children. And as you read here, that's dependent on them understanding his commandments, statutes, judgments, what he has commanded. There's even a day where God expects children to ask, why do we do the things that we do? And the answer can be given to them in a clear way if we read on in Deuteronomy chapter 6. When that day comes and the sons ask, then you shall tell them and explain to them God's word. Um, it also uh, requires parents to understand in order to teach. 
right? As a parent, it's not, don't get comfortable just not understanding God's word. Work hard to grow in your understanding of God's word. I'm speaking to the choir here because you're here seeking to grow in your equipping and understanding of God's word uh, so that you can become, Lord willing, more articulate in your own home with your children as you instruct them. I love this quote from J.C. Ryle in The Duties of Parents, that little pamphlet. He says, you cannot make your child love the Bible, I allow. None but the Holy Ghost can give us a heart to delight in the word, but you can make your children acquainted with the Bible and be sure they cannot be acquainted with that blessed book too soon or too well. A thorough knowledge of the Bible is the foundation of all clear views of religion. He that is well grounded in it will not generally be found a waverer and carried about by every wind of new doctrine. Any system of training which does not make a knowledge of Scripture, the first thing is unsafe and unsound. Some are to be found who honor a catechism more than the Bible, or fill the minds of their children with miserable little storybooks instead of the scripture of truth. But if you love your children, let the simple Bible be everything in the training of their souls, and let all other books go down and take the second place. Care not so much for their being mighty in the catechism as for their being mighty in the scriptures. This is the training, believe me, that God will honor. How clear is God's word really? Answer six, clear enough to be understood by unbelievers. Clear enough to be understood by unbelievers. In Deuteronomy chapter 28 and 29, well, 28 catalogs the curses that are going to come on Israel because of their disobedience once they actually get into the land. We're probably more familiar with the last verse in Deuteronomy 20, 29, then what comes before it? Because verse 29 says, the secret things belong to Yahweh our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe all the words of this law. Well, there are things that God doesn't disclose to us. They're secret, they're hidden. Some have used this passage and passages like it to say, see, God is infinitely deep. We shouldn't expect him to be able to speak clearly. We shouldn't expect to be able to understand what he's spoken from his infinite depths. You'll notice that what comes just before this verse in Deuteronomy 29, Moses makes a covenant with this nation and the subsequent ones, the subsequent generations. And then verse 22, now the generation to come, your sons who rise up after you, the foreigner who comes from a distant land, this is a generation not hearing these words, so they're not the original audience. This is a, even those who don't share the same, what sociologists have called social location, They're foreigners. They're coming into the nation, not acquainted with the culture and the customs. When they come, and when they see the plagues of the land and the diseases with which Yahweh has afflicted it, they will say, verse 23, all its land is brimstone and salt, a burning waste, unsown and unproductive, and no grass grows in it, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which Yahweh overthrew in his anger and in his wrath. And, verse 24, all the nations. The circle's been expanded, not just to the generation to come, foreigners who come in, but all the nations will say that they have clarity about why this is happening. Why has Yahweh done this to this land? Why this great outburst of anger? 
Then they will say, because they forsook the covenant of Yahweh, the God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went and served other gods and worshiped them, gods whom they have not known and whom he had not allotted to them. Therefore, the anger of Yahweh burned against this land to bring upon it every curse, which is written in this book. They have clarity about what's happening to the land of Israel because they read the Torah. The nations can have clarity, will have clarity because of what Moses wrote in the first section of the Bible. The word of God can be understood by unbelievers. Even 1 Corinthians 1 implies this when it says that the message of the cross The word of the cross is foolishness to those who don't believe. You don't understand in a believing way because you don't believe. But that message of the cross is so clear that they've come to a judgment, a determination about it, that it's foolish and should not be believed. It would have to first be clear to them before they were offended by it. If a baby is speaking gibberish, nobody's offended by a baby's gibberish. They can't understand. It's inarticulate. It's unclear. There's no cause for offense there. God's word is so clear, it's clear enough to offend the unbeliever. So it's incumbent on us to make sure that we are articulating God's word clearly when we're talking to unbelievers, either clear enough to save them if they want to believe or clear enough to condemn them if they refuse to believe. Lastly, God's word is clear enough to make martyrs, even from the Old Testament. God's word was clear enough in the Old Testament to make martyrs of the men who spoke God's word. We saw this in Micaiah. He was so clear, had received such a clear word from God, and boldly spoke that clear word from God that he was eventually killed, he eventually starved because of it. But this is Jesus' testimony about the Old Testament prophets generally, Matthew 23, verses 29 to 36. Here's what Jesus says. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous. And you say, if we had been living in in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the guilt of your fathers you serpents, you brood of vipers, how will you escape the sentence of hell? Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, so that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. You can't find a prophet in the Old Testament who was persecuted or someone who was martyred in the Old Testament who was not killed because of the clarity of God's word. It's implied. Abel, even, who we don't have any recorded speech from Abel, he died because he offered right sacrifices. Where did he get instructions to offer right sacrifices? Who gave him instructions and told him what was an acceptable sacrifice or how to offer it in an acceptable way? That had to come by from God. God was the one who was pleased with his sacrifice. Abel, Moses and Aaron, Joshua and Caleb, Gideon, David, Elijah, Micaiah, Nehemiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, 
even John the Baptist, all clear on what God had said. And so they were persecuted, some of them even persecuted unto death, because they simply believe the crystal clear clarity of God's word. And if we are going to suffer well for Christ, we must also believe the crystal clear clarity of God's word. And next week we'll have several more answers to this same question, how clear is God's word? God, thank you so much for communicating with us. You were under no obligation. No one made you speak to us, and yet you disclosed what was clear in your own mind to us in increments, in parts, and by degrees, even to where we're living now, this side of the cross, we have 66 books of your perfect and pure word for us. Give us courage, God, to press in to studying your scriptures. Make us eager to hear from you as we read what you've written, and make us more courageous in the truth that we know to be true, even to the point of death, if you should call us to it. And we pray all these things in the name of Christ. Amen.